Okay, so let's move on and talk about instability of the wrist. So there are a lot of different ways to describe instability of the wrist. Wrist one is <clears throat> gross instability comes from the extrinsic uh, uh, ligaments. Uh, typically, not all that well seen by MR, but we'll we'll go through them. Uh, intermediate intermediate uh, stability comes from the intrinsic ligaments of the wrist, uh, which we're more concerned about typically with MRI, and then fine tuning comes from the triangular fiber cartilage. <clears throat> And there are a lot of classification system. One is uh, dissociative. Dissociative instability means you've got tears of the intrinsic ligaments of the wrist. Non-dissociative means that the instability comes from the extrinsic ligament tears. Central column instability is also described as uh, uh, dorsal and volar uh, uh, Intercalated? Thank you. Intercalated segmental instability. And uh, that, that we'll see where, where that name comes from in a minute. Uh, you have medial instability from... Uh, Intercalated. Yeah. Uh, from the triquetral hamate and triquetral lunate dissociation. Proximal instability is at the radius and ulnar uh, carpal ligaments. And there are actually many other ways to, to describe it as well. And that's because there, there are many bones here and there are many different ways where the, uh, the bones can no longer uh, move properly together under different forces. Uh, this is a Mayo classification. They talk about carpal instability, uh, non-dissociative carpal instability, complex, and then uh, adaptive carpal instability. Uh, so let's let's talk about some of these ligaments. If we talk about mid-carpal instability, we can have uh, on the palmar side, dorsal side, ulnar side, or at the capital lunate level. If we look at the uh, volar extrinsic ligaments, <clears throat> uh, we can kind of uh, see a diagram of, of them here uh, on our right side. There's the scapho uh, cap. Uh, radioscaphocapitate ligament, which is a thickening of the volar capsular sheet, uh, which goes between the, those three bones here. There's a radiolunotriquetral ligament, again, a thickening of that uh, volar sheet, uh, which goes between these three bones. And then there's a radioscapolunate, uh, the long luno, uh, radiolunar ligament, the ulnar lunate ligament, the ulnar triquetral ligaments. Uh, and through here. So these are the extrinsic ligaments. Sometimes this is with an old arthrogram. Sometimes we can see these ligaments kind of discreetly, <clears throat> usually <clears throat> in the coronal plane, especially if you don't give uh, contrast, it's very hard to see these. You just partial volume them because it's really a sheet of fibrous tissue on the volar and dorsal aspects of the risk. Usually you can see these a little bit better on the sagittal images uh, because then you're you're imaging the, the sheet of uh, fibrous tissue uh, cross-sectionally. So there's the ulnar triquetral ligament, radiolunotriquetral ligament coming through here, and the radioscaphoid capitate ligament uh, would be out here. If you go then into the sagittal plane through here, you can actually see those two volar ligaments, these, these two, the radioscaphal capitate and the radiolunotriquetral ligament as these two ligaments here. And you can follow them along. You can also see them in the axial plane down here. Uh, in this location. So typically when these are torn, uh, the patient has gross instability of the wrist. They don't always get imaging in that situation, uh, but you'll see basically uh, uh, evidence of edema and loss of the normal anatomy in, in these locations. So Robert, what do you think of this case? <clears throat> 
Oh well, never mind. I've got the uh, the results. The answers here. up there. So here's the uh, radio scaphal lunate ligament over here. We can see that there's a lot of edema, indistinct edema in that particular location. And uh, again, we can see all the edema in through here. On the axial images, uh, again, this is the area where we can see those two ligaments. And in this particular case, we're seeing a lot of edema and poor visualization of the soft tissues. So now if we go to the dorsal ligaments, the dorsal ex uh, uh, extrinsic ligaments uh, are basically the intercarpal ligaments going uh, right and left across the dorsal aspect of the wrist. Uh, the radioscaphoid ligament uh, coming over here between the scaphoid and the radius dorsally and the radiolunotriquetral ligament uh, coming across here more proximally. But again, these are just thickenings, really of typically fibrous sheets. And uh, if, you, if you see injuries in these particular areas, you can kind of look up and see what the ligaments are. But typically, people would just talk about uh, uh, injury to the dorsal capsule and say the location of the injury to the dorsal capsule. Okay. Um, See, Tayson. All right. Stas was fall three weeks ago. So there's some indistinctness to that dorsal capsule there, right? So right in through here. Yeah. This is what the normal dorsal capsule looks like. Here we can see this kind of soft tissue thickening dorsally here with a, a little bit of increased signal on the axial images. If we go to the sagittal images, <clears throat> this is the intact dorsal ligament at the second. The third is where they had symptoms, and we can we can see that it's injured in this area with edema going along the course of that ligament and a little bone edema in this case as well. And this was a dorsal capsule tear. Uh, the treatment for this is usually conservative with, with bracing until it heals. Okay, 49-year-old male fell six days ago, rule out TFCC tear. Um, I see edema and soft tissue thickening along the volar aspect of the distal radius. Okay, and this is probably a fracture of the radius, right? Yeah, yeah. And then if we go to the sagittal images. Again, we see that fracture, but then dorsally an effusion. I'm not sure if there's irregularity of that capsule, maybe a yeah. capsular tear. Right. And that was a dorsal capsular tear. <laughs> On the axial images, there's there's the area where you can see the soft tissue thickening. It's not normal and nice seen here. It's markedly thickened with increased signal intensity. And this is a dorsal capsular tear. And again, I usually don't try to go and figure out which actual ligament it is. Again, it's really a dorsal sheet. <laughs> and uh, and you know, they're usually not treated by, by surgical repair. So uh, detailed information is, is not as important as it would be for other, other ligaments. And that's what it looks like in an area where it's intact. There's where it's torn. It, it depends if it's stable or not. Um, okay. Sometimes you'll try you'll you'll, you'll try a conservative treatment for a while and see what happens. Um, it's a capsular structure, so that there's thickening um, between the bones. Um, where, where we call them ligaments, but uh, they're really just a thick piece of tissue uh, of the capsule. So uh, just because it's torn doesn't mean it's going to be unstable. Um, it may be stable if the intrinsic ligaments are intact, but that's a decision a surgeon has to make by examining and so on. 
Thanks, John. 18 year old male with ulnar sided pain following a football injury. Um, so I see some edema. Um, oh, that might just be. I can't hear you, Dan. Uh, see some edema along the ulnar aspect of the wrist. Through here? Yeah. So there's a fracture oh. there. Okay, so ulnar styloid fracture. So there's a fracture. Type 2 fracture at the base of the ulnar styloid. And up. TFC tear there. <clears throat> and there's a DMA in the area of the radioscaphoid ligament insertions. There's also this already um, ulnar capsule. So uh, and, and and ligaments that are uh, intrinsic. So uh, here again, you have to decide uh, what, whether it's stable or not. And then you can see that all the joints of the wrist should be uniform in thickness. Where you have asymmetry in the thickness, you have to be concerned that there's instability there. No, that doesn't look symmetrical, does it, from and and to Right. And and that portion. So this would be a carpal in, uh, instability non dissociative type. Uh, again, th these typically aren't aren't don't use MR to evaluate since these are really the uh, extrinsic ligament type injuries. Uh, but in this case, we saw the fracture of the TFC and the tear of the triangular fiber cartilage and the instability of the bones. Yeah. Well, with the fractures, the first thing you think of is fix the fracture. And, and then you think about the ligaments. Okay. So. Now let me just move on here. Okay. Okay, so uh, much of what uh, we used MR for is still looking uh, for intercalated type instability. So again, as we talked about, gross stability comes from the extrinsic lig ligaments, uh, which I think is kind of poorly evaluated by MR. And this was an article that made that point in AJR. The intermediate and fine tuning, these areas uh, are areas where MR is more valuable and evaluating the wrist. <clears throat> so the uh, tercolated instability, uh, uh, it's, it's quite common. The, the, the DC one is very common. It's uh, associated with, uh, with ligament tears, fractures, or inflammatory disease. Uh, VC instability is less common. It's also associated with ligament tears. Here the ligament tears escape a lunate ligament tear. Here it's a triquetral lunotriquetral ligament tears. Also, I have fractures on uh, the top one. Uh, this is associated with fractures of the waist of the scaphoid, which we know is a very common fracture. Uh, these are, can be due to other fractures, including triquetral fractures, which are much less common. And then you can have inflammatory disease. Then you can get fracture dislocation anywhere where you have bone in a joint. And uh, you can also get injuries to the distal radial ulnar joint. Uh, one thing that you have to be aware of is that there's normal physiologic motion of the wrists, and therefore the bone patterns depend upon the positioning of the, of the wrist. If you position the wrist in radial deviation when you do the imaging, it's going to lead to flexion of the proximal carpal row, and you'll get a pattern of association between the lunate and the capitate, which looks like a, DC, I mean, a VC pattern. Uh, if you have ulnar deviation, it leads to the opposite. And we'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute. And therefore, it's very important that the wrist be in neutral position when you do the imaging, or you can fool yourself that you have instability. So in the old days, uh, we used to always image the wrist in a plastic uh, splint so that you'd always be in a neutral position uh, when you did the imaging. I think now... Uh, uh, the text, we have so many different centers. Uh, the uh, 
quality control of the positioning is a little bit more uh, unreliable in, in this day and age. So <clears throat> again, you've got multiple layers of bones, <clears throat> which intrinsically can be very unstable. Uh, the wrist is normally under axial loading forces when you function with the wrist. Uh, and uh, it's typically generated by the extrinsic muscles of the forearm. The extensors and flexors, when they, when they fire together, they uh, pull the, the hand proximally into the radius and ulna, uh, which loads the, the joints. Uh, and uh, the wrist is primarily composed of two rows, uh, and therefore, in the engineering standpoint, you have an interculated segment uh, where you, instead of just having a, uh, a distal bone and a proximal bone at a joint, you have a distal bone, a, medial, a middle row, and a proximal bone. That leads to significant increased risk of instability in the way in which the wrist is, is created. That allows uh, increased motion of the wrist uh, the wrist for fine-tuning uh, activities with the hands, uh, but it can lead to increased instability uh, when something goes wrong. And this is what we see. Here's the capitate. The middle bone here is the lunate, and then the radius. Uh, and therefore, you have two, two joints in line here. The tendons tend to, to attach in the, in the mid-carpal row here, and that means that this segment of bones here uh, are, uh, are more vulnerable to instability uh, because these, these dorsal and volar uh, extrinsic ligaments go across it and attach to it, but they attach predominantly involving the radius and ulna and the middle carpal row, uh, not the proximal carpal row. Uh, this is the normal orientation. Normally, in a, in a normal wrist, the capitate, uh, if you draw a line along the capitate, it should bisect the lunate and, and bisect the articular surface of the radius. And as you all already know, but we'll talk about more, if the lunate subluxes anteriorly, it rotates dorsally, and then what happens is the, the uh, capitate uh, will not, inter if you draw a line along the long axis of the capitate, it won't intersect the lunate in the mid portion of the articulation here. Now, when that happens, the capitate can stay normally oriented with respect to the radius. It can sublux volarly or it could sublux dorsally. And we'll talk about those different positionings of the uh, carpal bones uh, uh, later. So this is a typical crankshaft, uh, crank theory. Uh, in a normal position, again, they should be collinear. But if you have a situation like this, where the capitate moves dorsally and proximally, and the lunate rotates, moves volarly and rotates dorsally, uh, this is called a, a dorsal intercalated segmental instability or a DC type pattern, uh, which is a very common pattern. If they go in the opposite direction, then it's a VC type pattern. And again, the DC pattern is commonly associated with the common injuries of the wrist, which are uh, uh, waist fractures of the scaphoid and scaphoid ligament tears. The DC type pattern, uh, which is the opposite pattern, is the less common injuries to the triquetrum and the triquetral lunate ligament. Now, under axial loading, uh, what you have are forces that balance themselves out so that the bones stay neutral in position. Uh, and what happens under axial loading, the, the scaphoid tends to want to flex, the triquetrum tends to, 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 to uh, palmar flex. The triquetrum wants to, wants to dorsiflex. But if all the ligaments and bones are intact, these two uh, <clears throat> tendencies will balance each other out. Uh, <clears throat> and 
will produce forces so that the wrist actually becomes more stable than it would be otherwise. But if you have tears of the scaphalunate ligament or the lunotriquetral ligament or fractures of the bones, then you no longer have uh, uh, forces which counteract this motion and you'll tend to get palmar flexion of the of the scaphoid. We saw examples of that when we saw scaphoid waist fractures uh, <clears throat> that can lead to distal flexion of the scaphoid. And it, if it heals in that location, it heals with a deformity, uh, <clears throat> uh, which we talked about before. Uh, and, that, and that also uh, <clears throat> will lead to abnormal orientation eventually of the capitate with respect to the lunate because you end up getting abnormal forces on the other ligaments, which become lax, and you end up with the DC pattern and instability. Uh, we already talked about this. The three most common causes of carpal instability are an unstable fracture of the scaphoid, usually scaphoid waist fracture, scaphalunate dissociation, or lunotriquetral dislocation. I think we've already talked about this. And that this is just a diagram. We don't need to go through this showing a waist fracture. Again, you, you, you no longer have mechanical integrity of the waist. The distal scaphoid then flexes forward, carries the, the capitate with us, and you end up then with a, uh, a, uh, a DC-type uh, instability eventually in the wrist when the other ligaments around the wrist tend to stretch out and uh, <clears throat> that can lead to DC. So again, we, if we remember Galula's, Galula's arch, uh, you can get instability patterns with fractures in the uh, mid, mid carpal fractures, or you can get instability from tears of the scaphalunatal lunotriquetral ligaments. Greater arch injuries and lesser arch injuries, kind of the classic injuries. Okay, uh, now, in, in evaluating these lesions, there, there are some uh, angles that, that can be helpful. Uh, there are the Galua arches that I uh, like to look for to make sure they're all nice and smooth and congruent. Uh, you can also look at the uh, uh, distal radial length, which is the uh, how, which basically tells you how steep the inclination is here on the uh, uh, Radial, distal radial joint in the coronal plane. Uh, and then uh, the length here. And then this is the inclination, which would be the degrees here. Uh, other x ray findings that you can look for are the, uh, the scaphoid line. Uh, this is a line basically showing the, uh, from the volar edge of the proximal and the volar edge of the distal scaphoid. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, uh, you, if you just... One of the problems with the x-rays is that um, there's always overlapping one bone on another bone or sometimes three to three or four bones overlapping. Yeah. So uh, you can have to choose a uh, certain positioning to get a, get what you are, are looking for if you know what you're looking for. Um, so there may be four or five different views that you might take, and that's what we used to use in the old days. Yeah. But now it's much easier with a CT and, and, uh, and MR. uh, MRI. Yeah. Now, uh, one thing about falls, uh, as you all know, you fall with your hands, uh, and I mean your your wrist, dorsi, um, dorsi flex or extended, uh, whatever words you want to use, and the, and the first force that happens is the scaphoid and the distal radius um, uh, hit the ground, and and there's a torque of the scaphoid. That's why the scaphoid gets injured more often. Than, than any of the other bones. Plus, of course, you got the collie's fracture too. Um, and I'm just a dorsal tilt. Good, thank you. So let's go through some of these lines because these can actually be helpful 
and evaluating MRIs. So there's a capitate line which goes down right through the mid portion of the capitate. There's the lunate line, which basically, if you draw a line going through the distal, volar, and dorsal aspect of the lunate, draw a 90 degree angle through that, uh, which bisects uh, the distal articulating surface of the lunate, that would be the lunate line, it bisects the lunate. And then there's the, the scaphoid line that I talked about before. So the capital lunate angle is actually the angle between the mid-axis of the lunate and the long axis of the capitate. It's this angle. And uh, uh, typically that's between 0 and 30 degrees. What that means is that uh, generally the lunate can uh, angle dorsally, move volarly, uh, <clears throat> and have that angle anywhere from 0 to 30 degrees. And a lot of that will depend upon the positioning of the wrist. If you dorsiflex the wrist, uh, you'll, you'll tend to get uh, uh, more of an angle than, than if it's in a straight neutral position. So if you're trying to, usually I just uh, eyeball the mid-sagittal cut on the MR images. Uh, but sometimes you can remember that angle should be between 0 and 30 degrees. Uh, if it's greater than 30 degrees, uh, that's pretty much always abnormal. But again, positioning of the wrist can make these vary. So generally, you'll look at, at that positioning in the mid-sagittal plane, and then you'll look at all of the other injuries in the wrist, and you're going to be much more concerned if you see a scapal lunate ligament tear, and you're going to be much more concerned if you see a, a, a scaphoid waist fracture. And... Uh, uh, and that, and you know, they also the other thing you'll look for, I think we'll talk about this in a minute, is whether you've got more dorsal displacement of the capitate. And then in severe disease, you'll get proximal migration of the capitate uh, that we'll talk about that makes it more severe. Uh, well, with x rays, uh, in, in my practice, I've always used uh, both sides. I would x ray them in the same position. Um, uh, uh, the wrist and the hand. Uh, I, I, I didn't just take one uh, one view or two views of one wrist. I al always uh, x-rayed both. Maybe that's too much radiation, but uh, I've had enough radiation. I should be done by now. <laughs> I, I, I don't think that, 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 that we're, we're overdue the radiation part. Yeah. We don't fit shoes like we used to um, by taking x-rays. Right. But the uh, x-rays of the wrist are pretty low risk. Yeah. And then there's the scaphal lunate angle that I use less, uh, less frequently. Okay. So, again, the pathophysiology. Uh, the scaphoid tends to pull the hand back. If you have an intact scaphoid, I'm just repeating this using different words. If you have an intact scaphoid, that means the distal part of the scaphoid does not flex forward. It stays uh, extended, and that stabilizes uh, the radial aspect of the wrist. Uh, so it, some people will say the scaphoid pulls the hand back. Uh, so if you have an unstable scaphoid fracture, then the distal end will, will flex. You'll get the beak dorsally. Uh, and you don't want it to fuse in that location because that, that, that'll lead to, uh, uh, to instability. Or the other thing you can have that can, call, that can uh, keep the scaphoid from holding the, the hand back is you can have a scaphoid lunate ligament tear because then the scaphoid is no longer attached to the lunate and, and therefore any uh, uh, pressure on the scaphoid uh, since it's no longer attached to the lunate, it'll flex forward. The whole bone will flex forward, not just at the fracture site. Uh, the tricretum, on the other hand, tends to push the hand forward. There. So they, they basically push the hand in, in, in opposite directions, and they, uh, uh, they, they force couple to stabilize the wrist. So if you have a, a lunotriquetral ligament tear, then the tricretrum is no longer able to push the hand forward, and that uh, allows you to get into a VC instability pattern. 
And this is kind of uh, what it can look like. Uh, these are just diagrams from uh, uh, Don Resnick's book. A VC pattern, we can see that the capitate in this case is a little bit more volarly positioned. The lunate is a little bit more dorsally positioned, often in this case, but we can see that it's that it's rotated uh, 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 in a more volar uh, degree. So this is a VC instability pattern. This is normal, where the capitate line go, is uh, collinear with the lunate line, which is collinear with the distal radius. And then there's the DC pattern, the more common pattern, where the uh, lunate tends to sublux anteriorly, rotate dorsally, and the capitate often tends to, to dislocate, uh, uh, move more dorsally, and obviously more in, in, a, in more severe cases that we'll talk about, becomes more proximally positioned closer to the radius called foreshortening of the wrist. And we've already talked about this. Okay, and this is just an old MR scan from low field scanners showing uh, this is a case where there was a little bit of dorsal uh, angulation, a little extension of the wrist at the time of imaging. And so here's the, the uh, it would be the capitate line, the lunate line would be through here, the radius line would be through there, uh, but this would be a normal general curve uh, through here, which would be normal positioning, uh, normal for this degree of mild extension of the wrist. Uh, this is a situation of someone who is unstable. And here we can see that the lunate is more is uh, 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 dorsally tilted. The capitate now, the long axis of the capitate doesn't really go through the mid part of the lunate anymore. It goes through the dorsal aspect of the lunate. And there's actually a little bit of foreshortening of the wrist where the capitate now is closer to the radius because of the instability. And you could draw the capitate lunate lines if you want and dress your angles, uh, which I, I really don't do very much. I look mostly at the injury pattern and the, uh, and the displacements of the bones. You're not gonna do push-ups with the DC. Okay. All right. So here we can see a scaphoid fracture through the waist of the scaphoid there. If we go to the sagittal images, what we can see here is the scaphoid fracture. The distal scaphoid should be up here. Remember, it holds the wrist back. It holds the hand back. In this case, because it's fractured, you don't have mechanical integrity between the distal scaphoid and the base of the scaphoid, so the distal scaphoid flexes forward. And then what happens then is that the base of the scaphoid will then uh, tend to become unstable as well, carry the lunate with it into a DC-type pattern. And it's rotated too, isn't it, John? Yeah. Uh, and uh, here we can see that we have a dorsal tilt to the lunate uh, and a little bit of a dorsal positioning of the capitate in this patient with a DC type instability pattern. No, no, I think most most hand surgeons would operate on these uh, that yeah. same evening if they can. Okay. And then if you want, you can see if the angle is greater than 30 degrees. But again, that depends so much upon the positioning of the wrist and so forth that I, I don't really use that angle anymore in uh, defining whether I think it's unstable or not. Uh, and here's just from an article in AJR, which is a CT arthrogram, uh, where again, you can see a DC pattern of the lunate, the long axis of the capitate is uh, nowhere close to collinear with the lunate axis. Uh, and, so, and uh, we can see there's a little foreshortening of the wrist here. So this is a uh, classic uh, DC type instability pattern. And here again, they like to use greater than 30 degree, this angle, this capital lunate angle greater than 30 degrees, uh, which may occasionally be helpful, but again, I don't use it that much. And then here's uh, showing how you use the uh, uh, scapulo, uh, 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 lunate axis here, uh, which I don't use at all. 
in this case, greater than 60 degrees. Okay, uh, I don't know who's next. Here, uh, Taysen, why don't you take this one? All right. So it looks like we have some dorsal subluxation and volar tilt of the lunate and, and okay. some volar positioning of the capitate. So, got, so we have a DC angulation. Yeah. Again, we can see that the joint space is not, or not perfectly congruent. So that also helps us know that we're dealing with an instability pattern. Um, well, there's probably a little bit of foreshortening of the wrist here where the capitate is creeping closer to the radius and obviously the dorsal tilt. In this particular case, we could also see a fracture. And then again, here we can see a distal scaphoid fracture. Okay, and I th we saw a case like this before. We actually we probably saw this this actual case. Here we can see an old fracture of the scaphoid. There is flexion distally, and here we can see that this is a very abnormal alignment where the distal aspect of the scaphoid is flexed forward. We and here we have this uh, point uh, dorsally here, which is a called a humpback deformity, uh, showing that this uh, scaphoid has a healed in an abnormal flex position. So as John was saying earlier, you like to operate on these before you get healing in an abnormal position, before you then, this leads to then stresses on all the other ligaments, uh, instability of the wrist. So eventually, even if you go back and try to correct this, it's too late because a lot of the other ligaments in the wrist have been stretched and you already have instability. Usually, more, sooner than four four weeks. Once the four weeks go by, you're in trouble. Thanks, John. Now, when you have this kind of instability pattern, uh, <clears throat> over time it can uh, progress to more and more disease, eventually getting what's called scaphoid non-union advanced collapse. So that snack, you can have this same disease process occur when it's not a uh, non-union fracture, but a scaphoid ligament tear, if you don't treat it and stabilize it soon enough. And basically, initially, you'll get degenerative disease. Excuse me. Uh, uh, over here, involving the distal articulation of the scaphoid and the radius. That will then progress to greater degenerative changes around that distal and, and then move into the proximal fragment. And then finally, most severe disease, you'll end up getting degenerative disease also between the, the capitate and lunate, because remember the capital lunate articulation now is, is unstable due to a uh, uh, DC type pattern of instability. And the more degenerative disease you have, the more symptoms you have, uh, typically. So, uh, Elior, what do you think of this case? Yeah, so we have a scaphoid waist fracture and, uh, yeah, degeneration. And, uh, yeah, dorsal tilt of the lunate. Right. And then here we have hibernation. We have foreshortening of the wrists and uh, dorsal migration of the capitate here, where it's uh, in this particular case. And then if you do the angles, it's very abnormal. And, and then this one, we can see a lot of degenerative changes around that distal fragment, uh, uh, but not much involving the lunate. So this would be a, a snack too. Uh, I don't know very many people who actually use this grading system on reports, uh, but be aware of it. And uh, I would just describe the degree of degenerative change. So if somebody wants to use it, they can they can do it based upon your report. But I think it's mostly for, for research purposes, like most of these uh, categories, rather than for clinical decision making. 
one of the things about time um, that you don't want a deformity of a, a fracture to develop so that you cannot fit the bones together. So the sooner you operate them, the closer you are to normal anatomy. Um, otherwise, if you wait, uh, there's a deformity of the small bones and they're very difficult to fit together. Then you wind up with fusions and or excisions. So uh, time is, is something very, very important. And the reason I mention that to you guys is uh, uh, call the doctor, uh, call the orthopod, let them know what the situation is. That's something that needs to be done sooner than later. Thank you, John. Okay, Danny. So on the sagittal, it looks like the lunate is rotated anteriorly with the capitate space kind of anteriorly oriented as well. So that would be visi. Okay, so this is more visi. Now we've got an anterior subluxation of the capitate, foreshortening of the wrist again. Uh, what else do we see in this coronal image here? Uh, it looks like a scaphoid fracture. Yeah, so here we have a scaphoid fracture. So this is a scaphoid fracture where we actually have visi instead of dissi, uh, which can happen. Uh, and a lot of this depends upon uh, the forces on the lunate and which way the lunate goes. This is actually called a transscaphoid perilunate dislocation, and this is one of the greater arch uh, type injuries uh, that you can have. Uh, this it involves not just the scaphoid, this in general, uh, also involves ligamentous injuries and, and, and can also involve other carpal bone fractures. So it's a more complex pattern than if you just have a, a waist fracture with a DC type pattern. Now, uh, so let's talk a little bit about lunate patterns. So <clears throat> if you look at the, at the lunate, there are a number of ways in which you can have injuries around the lunate. Uh, one, this is kind of the normal, again, where the capitate, lunate, and radius are kind of collinear. Uh, then there's a perilunate dislocation uh, where actually the capitate, the capital lunate articulation uh, dors uh, 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 dorsally subluxes. Then there's a mid-carpal uh, lunate uh, uh, dislocation where the capitate is only slightly dorsally positioned. The lunate is uh, anteriorly dislocation, dislocated uh, outside of the uh, fossa between the capitate and the distal radius. And then there's a full lunate dislocation where the capitate is back in normal position, but you just have, uh, the only thing you have is an anteriorly dislocated lunate. And these are kind of progressive, more and more soft tissue injuries occur to, to go from the normal all the way up to the lunate dislocation. So we're going to come back to that uh, uh, later on, probably in the next lecture. So let's talk a little bit about scaphalunate ligament tears. So the, there are three components to the scaphalunate ligament. There's the membranous portion, uh, and then there are the dorsal and volar portions. The membranous portion is the one which is evaluated when you do, uh, primarily when you do an arthrogram, but the membranous portion of the ligament is not mechanically important but it's what usually disintegrates, allowing uh, contrast to extend from the uh, proximal to the mid-carpal uh, uh, area. So what we now know, which I, I didn't really realize in the pre-MR days very much when we were doing arthrograms of the wrist, uh, is that just because you have a communication between the proximal and middle carpal joints, you may have a scaphalunate ligament tear, but the vast majority of those tears actually are mechanically unimportant. And in fact, when people over the age of 50, the vast majority of people over the age of 50 will have a membranous tear if you do an arthrogram on them. So basically, normal older people will have a positive arthrogram. 
Uh, there's no there's no reason to do arthrograms, is there, John? Uh, I don't or think so. And folks at that age. No, I, I think it can be very misleading, so I, I don't recommend it. Uh, we used to do a lot of MR arthrograms in the early days of MR, but we pretty much don't do those anymore because I think they can be misleading. The actual communications are less important as the majority of them uh, indicate an, a mechanically unimportant membranous tear. Uh, what you really need to see are the dorsal and volar ligaments because they are the actual mechanical stabilizers. Uh, and you can see those better by direct visualization with MR. So uh, wrist arthrography is pretty much gone out of, out of favor. Yes, John? The fellows will find out when they're over 50. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so wrist arthrography, it may be helpful in evaluating scaphalunate ligament, uh, but uh, the, the situation is uh, it's not great for evaluating the dorsal and volar components, uh, and they're the important ones. And just you got to remember, you can get tears of the scaphalunate ligament at instability. They can heal by scarring and be uh, watertight. So uh, wrist arthrography is not very sensitive for instability. And the specificity is debated uh, because, the, especially in anyone over the age of 50, uh, most people who are asymptomatic are going to have membranous tears, which will give you a positive arthrogram, but they're stable. So uh, uh, I, I think there's a good reason why risk arthrography is not a common procedure in this day and age. Okay, so now uh, let's talk about, let's go back and talk about uh, uh, perilunate instability. Well, I don't know. We'll come back to that. I'm sorry. So, so here, here is an uh, wrist arth uh, arthrogram, uh, which we can see here. There's contrast placed in the proximal carpal joint space, and we see no contrast uh, here distally. The stir image shows a little bit of fluid there, but it's not contrast as seen on the T1 weighted fat suppressed image. When you do these, you can often over distend uh, the proximal carpal roll, uh, leading to fluid extending into and distending the pre-styloid recess. When you see this, you've got to be concerned that you've over distended the proximal carpal roll. When you do that, you can then get contrast extending uh, just by pressure into the middle carpal roll, and that doesn't indicate that you have unstable tears of the scaphalunate ligament. Uh, you can also force contrast uh, into the uh, 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 triquetral pisiform joint space. Uh, and if you have enough pressure, that can actually force it to, to go from the pisiform triquetral joint space into the mid-carpal roll as well. So th there are a lot of ways, if you over-distend the joint, that you can get a false positive. And you don't want to over-distend the pre recess. Uh, that that puts you in a danger territory for having a false positive. Okay. The, the two smallest bones in the wrist. Okay. This form and Right. Yep. So here's another arthrogram. We can see fluid in the pisiform triquetral joint space here. Uh, contrast. Uh, here we can see a little bit of increased signal intensity in the membranous portion of the scaphalunate ligament, uh, and therefore we have contrast in through here. This allows contrast to go into the mid-carpal row, so this is a positive arthrogram. But if you look here, here are the dorsal and volar scaphalunate ligaments, and they're perfectly normal and intact. So this is another false positive uh, arthrogram uh, because what you're forcing is contrast to go through a degenerative membranous portion of the scaphalunate ligament when you still have mechanical integrity. Okay. And here's just another arthrogram, and here we can see the 
volar and dorsal ligaments, a little bit nicer when you have arth arthrography in there. In this case, we have contrast going into the mid-carpal row uh, uh, due to a central perforation of the membranous portion of the scapholunate ligament. It, it doesn't tell you where to operate, though. Right. And this is just a, another showing the dorsal and volar ligaments are intact, but we have contrast extending into the proximal row through a membranous tear. Okay, let me see. Uh, does anybody know who's next? I think Robert. Okay, Robert. All right, we have a 68-year-old female with wrist pain three weeks after fall, rule out fracture. I don't see a fracture. There's some sclerosis, probably proximal scaphoid maybe. And then it looks like there's a little fluid on the uh, PD fat set that's emanating from that, that region. Okay. Yeah, here it looks like there's a tear of that scaphalunate ligament. Yeah, and here in the axial plane, we can see that there's a tear of the volar component of the scaphalunate ligament. Mm -hmm. uh, as, as well as a membranous tear that we saw before. Uh, here's a CT scan showing maybe a little bit of diastasis uh, between the two. And, and this was an unstable scaphal uh, lunate ligament tear uh, because we have a, a tear of the boulder component. And that's quite a space in that one area. Yeah. Can you, can you go back, John? Not quite that. No. Right there, if you look at the x ray, see the space between the um, lunate and the uh, distal to the lunate. And the distal to the lunate, there's something missing there. You mean in here? Yes. Well, I think this is a CT that doesn't scan. Look normal. Well, I think we're it's a CT scan, and we're, we're just it's a. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry. It's not a plain I, film. I'm, I'm thinking X-ray. Right. Right. Yeah. So I, I'm so old-fashioned. I guess. <laughs> that's fine, John. Uh, keep us honest here. Uh, Jason. All right. So I think there is a partial defect of that scaphalunate right there. Yeah, I'd be concerned about that. Okay, and so the, here are the axial images. So the dorsal band looks intact. Uh, maybe on the scaphoid side of the scaphalunate ligament, the volar band. Right. There's a and it's what happens. Uh, these dorsal and volar bands, they tend to tear off the bone. And so here we can see a tear uh, of the uh, uh, volar scaphoid lunate ligament uh, coming off the scaphoid there. Yeah. Okay. Okay, 33 year old and it's these old Arthur grabs. <laughs> Making um, it easy for you. Yeah, it looks like some widening of that scapholunate interval, some contrast um, traversing that space. You have TFCC as well. Yeah, you can see the peripheral tear and the, the TFC involving. No, we'll talk about that, that later. And then here we can see. Yeah. Right. Okay. So that's volar and dorsal? Yeah, this is both. You don't see nice black lines going across here. Uh, okay, Danny, why don't you take the last one here? <laughs> 
ink. Okay, so there's a little defect there. Yeah, so here we can see that there's a little revulsion of the membranous portion of the scapulonic ligament, like scapegoat ossifers. In this case, we, we have a, 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 a tear of the lunotriquitral ligament off the uh, triquitrum as well. And remember, this would be a lesser arch injury using the Galula's uh, uh, system uh, on both of these. So in a case like this, uh, you'd, you'd want to look carefully at the axial images for the scaphalunate ligament. Uh, the axial images I find less reliable with the lunotriquitral ligament. And there also, you don't get separation of the bones, you get displacement of the bones. So you can get uh, mechanically important lunotriquitral ligaments, uh, injuries without diastasis between the two bones because the forces cause displacement, not separation. Whereas on the scaphal lunate size, the, the forces cause separation as well as displacement, but it's, the separation is easy to see. And then here is a hockey player where we can also see abulsion injuries on uh, those ligaments, a little bit of a diastasis here, and um, a lesser arch injuries. But why don't we stop here and we'll carry on this discussion tomorrow, uh, Thursday, okay? Have a good evening, everybody. Okay. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you.